at this point with daily operation it's 92 where um because you're in so many different types of music as D&D &D was shifting to becoming more of a rap studio did you find yourself more into rap less into rap did you only listen to rap like what was happening with personally music? yes i have a very eclectic uh musical taste um just growing up and you know, I was into like Return to Forever, the West in Peace Chikoria, who just passed away, and a huge deadhead, um, jazz. So I, I was always very open to all types of music, but certainly as as rap was becoming more prevalent at D and D, became something I loved and uh, listened to in my car, and, and became a, a fan of for sure. Okay, and then for also sure. with with the growth of the business of rap with D and D did you guys ever uh, interact with the labels? Did you mostly interact with the labels for the billing and for the scheduling and how did that work? Yeah, we used to get POs. Uh, I remember the first time I got a biggie PO, I was on the phone and, you know, was all excited with Arister and oh man, big's coming. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was kind of my role. I had great relationships with, with the people at the labels and, um, certainly a lot of that stuff was major label stuff or small independence. And then you had the guys who were just trying to get on, who would just come in and, uh, block out 10, 12 hours and, you know, pay at the end of the day. Um, we had a four hour minimum. We didn't like people just coming in there for an hour and going, okay. So, you know, we had that. Uh, and again, it, after a short period of time, it was like we were, until we built our Studio D, we were like a one room studio because Prem had B just locked down. We, we weren't putting people in that room because he just had it most of the time. And then if he had a mix up because we didn't have the total automation, he would take a masking tape and put a big X across the board. Like no one touched this. You know, so the, it wasn't like we could book that room. And we were thrilled with that. It wasn't, you know, a bust on us. But uh, so it became more the booking aspect was more of a one room studio. Okay. Uh, and, and you brought up Arista. When you guys got the deal uh, to put out records yourself, how, how and why did that happen? Well, listen, we had all these great people coming through there. Um, and uh, I met uh, a gentleman uh, named Hash Gorelli. Uh, and he was an a &R guy for Arista. Um, and I invited him up to the studio. Uh, to some degree, KRS-One was like, dude, wait, to me and Doug, dudes, I should say, you know, you guys have every MC, every producer in the world coming up here. Why aren't you putting out records? And that kind of lit a light bulb. So uh, through a gentleman named Joey Carvello, who's, uh, I want to say he was at Atlantic at the time. He's a big dance, you know, he's a legendary guy. Um, he introduced me to Hosh, who's brand new at Arista, kind of Clive's new uh, guy that he had a lot of faith in. Um, and, uh, you know, he came up and he saw what was going on and he saw the potential and, we signed the deal with Arista. I don't know if you can see him. Mm -hmm. you, you yeah, you got it right there. Of course. The Indie Project. So that, that was our first record. That was the, uh, uh, you know, the best of the producers that worked out at D&D &D with young MCs. Um, so, and One Two Pass It was on that as well. Absolutely. That one... <clears throat> like I said, Dougie Fresh, but then also Karis won. Mad Lion kicked it off. Right. He so wasn't he wasn't scheduled, but uh, Chris Karis won was like, hey, get him on there. And uh, we did, and it was it was a fantastic, a why, a why, a why, a why. You know, it was a great intro, and uh, certainly hap uh, very happy that that happened like that. Well, bringing it to Karis won then, given that you did more of the relationship type of stuff, what, um, it's just interesting that a conversation with Karis One leads to this opportunity for you. 
But how did you, as you developed your relationship with a Karis One or a DJ Premier or 45 King or different things, mm -hmm. what did you find um, you were learning from them that was really, other than this one instance with Karis One, that was really opening your eyes, either about life, business, sonics, rap, whatever? What well, was all that, all that. <laughs> Uh, I was very lucky that Prem and I became close friends very quickly outside of the studio, uh, in the studio. He really is, uh, you know, someone very, very, very special in my life to this day. We talk all the time. And, and I went on tour with Gangstar and he just blessed me to such a degree. He was just so incredible to me. And so during that, when he was recording, he would always say, yo, you know, hit the intercom. I say, loud why not? Chris is, Chris is about to spit. And so I would go in a lot. I would roll a joint or whatever it was. And I'd go and I got to sit and be part of, you know, as a fly on the wall when I say part of, but uh, like the sound of the police. or, um, And then after, you know, the guys would spit, you sit and you chop it up and you talk about life, philosophy. What are you doing uh, so that it became, and I was just a student because imagine sitting there with Karis One and Preem and they're chopping it up and I'm just sitting there with like my ears like, oh my God, like I'm so blessed in this universe just to be sitting in this chair and hearing what these dudes are saying. So, and they were, they were very respectful of me. I was part of it. They knew uh, who I was, that I came out of that, that Rasta you know, Jamaica life. And so they had, a, you know, we just chopped it up. We, it was just very comfortable and friendly and ideas back and forth. And, uh, you know, that was part of it. And then what made you and the 45 King link so well? You just Mark is so witty and smart, as I always tell you. And he, but he has kind of an off sense of humor. So if you don't get him, you kind of don't get him. Um, I just remember once, you know, in my in my office, I had a big office in the back. I had this desk, and Mark and Louis Fat Cat Vega, who uh, you know, great producer, did some gangsta stuff. Did Moni Love? Did a lot of stuff. Louis Louis was up there all the time, and you know, they were both kind of big guys, as I am, and they had a competition who could get up off the couch without using their hands. And it was among the funniest, they're like leaning on each other and they were very close. They were good friends. And it was just so fun. And uh, I said, this guy's great. You know, he doesn't take himself seriously. And he's just, uh, he's a special cat. And, uh, you know, to this day, I speak to Mark uh, almost every day, if not every day. And I can't say that. I mean, I speak to Priam on a weekly, you know, every other week, whatever, we, we catch up. But Mark and I speak daily, daily. Oh, that's great. That's, yeah, that's incredible. One other, um, what about with uh, Duck Down? The thing that's interesting is, you know, people, I think a lot of times now that we're a little bit removed, they just look at like 90s New York rap and kind of lump it all together. But right. there were all these different distinctive movements that were going on simultaneously. And Duck Down, of course, was one of them. Sure. So with with the beat miners, how did they work, would you say, differently than Premier, from what you could tell? Well, we did a lot of work initially with Fresh Records. Michael Weiss, who was ducked down, was part of that. So in our earlier stages of remixes and dance, Fresh was in there quite a bit. Uh, in fact, Tila Rock, as I remember, was through Michael, pre duck down, but I'm pretty sure that was Fresh. So... It just was, uh, you know, as we were growing in hip hop, I don't know if they came to Supreme or, or what it was. It just became, you know, uh, the place to go. And, and they were a huge part. I said, besides Supreme, the Duck Down dynasty and organization and all those OGCs and Black Moons and Helter Skelter. And, you know, they, they kept us really busy in the A room. So that it was like they were totally family. Mr. Walt and Evil D are just, you know, I have a habit of saying how much I love these guys, but I do. They were just such tremendous, hardworking, 
uh, you know, those guys were no nonsense. They would just, uh, they got it done. And then the MCs would come because they, they were kind of the, the basis of all that stuff as far as uh, beats and production. So they were comfortable there. They were in the A room with Kieran, Kieran Walsh. And they loved Kieran. And uh, in fact, like if, uh, as I remember, if, if Kieran wasn't available, they, they more or less wouldn't uh, book the room just like Priam and Eddie. Um, and, uh, you know, it just became their home like it was Primo's home, uh, equally. Right. And, I, you know, the, the MCs, uh, you know, you know the guys, they're just tremendous, tremendous, uh, great records. Uh, Sean Price, I mean, what can you say? Uh, Tack and Steel, I mean, just... Uh, <laughs> you know, mind boggling. And they had their own sound, their own look, uh, their own merchandise, you know, that duck down stuff. Drew Ha was just brilliant and he kept that crew together. And um, it, it was amazing. It was amazing. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.